DSL and this amazing art exhibit by Roberto Juarez. We're so happy to have it. It was designed for this space, for this time, and in honor of TSL and all the amazing work that we've done for 50 years. Go clap. <laughs> Welcome his compatriot and this great art advisor and genius, Edward Sullivan, to our space. He's a big fan of TSL, so it's very fitting that he should return to have this wonderful discussion. So take it away, gentlemen. We're going to speak up. We don't have a microphone. Oh, we're, we will. We're counting on the human voice being considered as part of our experience. Yeah. I, I, I can reach 150 students way up All in the right. balcony, so don't worry. Where is Aura? OK, this is turned off. So Roberto and I were trying to figure out who would sit on the throne and who would sit on the uh, school chair. <laughs> right. So we didn't, we didn't draw lots, but I'm sitting on what he describes as a professor's throne. So anyway, I am, as Linda very kindly introduced us, and thank you very much. I'm, I'm OK, you can't hear me? You can also come. This is not your undergraduate class. OK. You, you, you can also, if you wish, pull your chairs up right to the, uh, right to the front. So that would be fine. Um, I just wanted to set the stage, as it were, uh, for our conversation. And you all know Roberto, you know his great work. Uh, I am an old friend of Roberto's. Actually, I first saw his work many, many years ago, but in person I first saw it at the John Davis Gallery, just uh, another block away in maybe 2009, 2010, something like that. And uh, we've been great friends ever since. Uh, with me and Roberto and Roberto's husband, David Freeberg, and my wonderful Clayton Kirking, who is also here. We, are, uh, we have enjoyed the brilliance of this artist for a very long time. And I had uh, the great privilege of being able to organize an exhibition, curate an exhibition of his work at the Museum of Con Contemporary Art in Boulder, Colorado in, I think, 2016. But that was by no means the only collaboration we've done. And I was thinking back to 2011 when we did a similar talk in the uh, Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, not terribly far from here, uh, for another show that Roberto did, which was uh, in Pittsfield, and which, like today's exhibition, I think is a sort of um, all-encompassing uh, a series of images that are coherent, that make sense. In the case of the show in Pittsfield, there were enormous uh, paintings that he had done for a, a, a mural commission in uh, for uh, various courthouses in Florida, in Miami and elsewhere in Florida. So these were grand paintings that would go in a very official building. In this case, they are made, as Linda pointed out, for this space, for Time and Space Limited, which uh, I also must um, pay homage to the place that I think is such, uh, holds such an immensely important role within the cultural life, not only of Columbia County and New York State, but uh, beyond, because Hudson, of course, has a great uh, has become a great mecca for uh, visitors from all over the world, and the uh, the fact that there is a film program, a performance program, a uh, a very lively art, obviously art program here, uh, and has it's been going for a number of many years, 50 years if you count New York City and uh, and Hudson. Uh, it has become the place for the cultural advancement and the cultural presence in this very important city. And you've played, both of you uh, have 
um, played Claudia Bruce and uh, Linda Musman have played uh, a, an enormous role within that cultural uh, resurgence, or let's say surgence, of Hudson. I wasn't around when Hudson was sort of on the skids in the 1940s and 50s, but uh, I have been here because Clayton and I have a house in Taconic and Hudson is the city. And so since 1997, we've been coming here and to Hudson. And uh, when Roberto told me that he painted these, well, I, I knew this, I couldn't come to the opening, but uh, he painted each one of these with a very specific uh, uh, idea in mind about putting them together for the celebration of the 50 years of this cultural center, uh, it all made even more sense. And I have had uh, this opportunity to speak with uh, Roberto. I'm going to let him talk in a moment. But um, I, you know, I just wanted to say a few preliminary words about my own impressions of this show. It is about mythologies. And mythologies are stories. And we all have our own stories. We internalize mythologies that we were taught in school, maybe Greek or Egyptian mythologies. We have family mythologies, all the stories of aunt this and uncle that and grandfather this and grandmother that. Whether they're true or not, they enter into our consciousness as children and form part of, uh, of who we are. And then we have the national mythologies, uh, sometimes very brutal and sometimes very benevolent. Uh, but they also come into play, and national mythologies are at this moment very, very much uh, in the controversial mode. You all know it's happening in places like Texas and Florida, where uh, the mythologies of certain things like enslavement are very much in the, uh, the idea of, uh, of um, uh, debate. So I think the notion of making something that has to do with this whole field of mythology, uh, whether personal, national, cultural, familial, is very exciting to me. And even looking around this room, uh, there are certainly some of the paintings in which the mythologies of the ancient Western world, such as the work that's between the two windows uh, with a Koros figure, a Kore rather, uh, a Greek, um, a figure from Greek mythology, or the uh, the painting at the extreme left of this gallery, uh, which has the Ibis and Horus, uh, the Greek god of Horus. And you see so much of this intermingling, but at the same time there are other myths and other legends that are more local. For example, in the outside of this uh, room, there are preparatory studies, drawings, paintings, and photographs, manipulated photographs, uh, many of them of nature. And nature, of course, is at the root of uh, storytelling and mythology and our rootedness to nature. And uh, Roberto and David live in a very beautiful, place in uh, Canaan, surrounded by woods and a river, and uh, the mythologies of the past that are ongoing, and I'm talking about real nature, uh, he has absorbed and put into his image bank. And we all have image banks in our minds, but we don't have, for most of us, the talent to create a, uh, a series of works of art, in this case drawings, paintings, and these spectacular, uh, uh, this, in this beautiful installation, that tells a story. So the first thing I would like to ask Roberto is the idea of the myth. Some of the myths are well known to all of us, like you know, the myths that are related to Egypt. And you have told me a very interesting story about your early relationship with Egypt, which I'd love you to talk about. Maybe you could talk about that first. And the second thing is how you have in these works integrated your interest in classical Western mythology with the ideas of nature and growth and rebirth and how did all the things in this exhibition blend together. But first, talk about Egypt and the backyard in Chicago. Okay. We lived in Chicago, and we had a, a backyard that was pretty much dirt. There was one tree, and it was where we were allowed to play. And during the day, I would pretend I was in Egypt, because I thought that's the most exotic, most beautiful thing. And I learned about Egypt from the newspaper, 
that I would always go to the movie section of the newspaper and there was Cleopatra being promoted, overly promoted, over and over again. And I started dreaming about where Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were meeting. And this is where I wanted to be. And so that's what started this kind of creating a special place for imagination and play. And so I think of TSL as that kind of place. But I, I wanted to, but of course I will interrupt you often, okay. or not really too much. All right. But when we were talking about, most recently, the movie Cleopatra, I said to Roberto, did you ever actually see it? And he said, no, because it was condemned by the Catholic Church. I said, I know exactly what you mean, because I, you grew up in Chicago, I grew up in New York, and the Brooklyn Diocese, which was that of our, where we lived, uh, would publish every, new, every week um, a newspaper called The Tablet. And I would also go to the condemned page. What is condemned this week? And Cleopatra was definitely among the top two. <laughs> and, and you asked your uh, older brother to take you, and he wouldn't. He would take me. But he took you to? See, Irma Laduce. <laughs> no, I'm sure that was on the condemned list, but it was the only one we could get to. So I dreamt about what Egypt was. I dreamt about what Egyptian culture was. And I think that's what happens in these spaces that TSL has created. People use their imaginations. They create something that's unique to being safe, being sure. And so... Uh, and, and so how, before we go on to the, the nature part, I'm so intrigued oh. by your blending uh, and sort of playing with the, inher the, the inheritance of the classical world in paintings. For example, this painting I, I pointed out a few minutes ago, but it, it has this Greek uh, figure from antiquity amidst a cactus from Mexico. So you were making these uh, leaps of time and space, and they're unlimited in the case of Roberto Juarez. Uh, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, because this is obviously a, a reference as there is also a cactus in the painting at the extreme end of this section um, to your Mexican, Puerto Rican uh, background. Well, it comes from a little cactus that I bought in Mexico that was from nativity scenes for Christmas. And every year I've pulled it out and it's always been around me. And I think as artists we keep things that we imagine to be something else. And this is something I've kept for many years and finally I could use it. In that I wanted these goddesses, this is called Ghost Goddess, and there's two goddesses on, on this picture. And one of them is arriving and the other one is leaving depending on what platform they're sitting on. And the reference to Mexico is something I've used traditionally in my work because my father is of Mexican descent and my mother's Puerto Rican. So there's this culture mixed up already in my who I am. And so the idea that I could mix up culture in my paintings is always something that I felt I had a license to do. And it helps me use my imagination. So this tall goddess, which is based on the Greek sculpture, has a crown on top, which is like a a hairdo from that period of ancient times, but it's actually a basket that I bought at a thrift store that I <laughs> took a picture of and then put it into the painting. But it, there's, and, you know, things that come to you, some things immediately and some things from a long, long time ago, come together in my paintings. And popular culture is, you brought that up a second ago, it is also a very important, plays a very important role because you have a very large collection of postcards, of clippings from magazines and all sorts of things that you integrate uh, either the images themselves or uh, references to them. And sometimes they're of ancient things and sometimes they're, as you say, a photograph in a newspaper of a basket or some you know, thing that's on sale on Amazon or something like that. Yeah, well, I, I go to thrift stores a lot for, you know, decades and decades. And one thing I always collected was Egyptian postcards. Mm -hmm. And so to finally actually be able to use this postcard of this Egyptian goddess in a painting was just a pleasure. You know, so part of my technique of painting is to enjoy what I'm doing, enjoy what I'm showing or what I'm sharing. And so this goddess now is in the hallway there because it was too powerful. I had that in this room and had designed these two panels of kind of, of pine branches as passages on each side of this goddess. 
and it took over the room. You couldn't see any other painting once it was in this room. So that's why she is now in the entryway. And you approach her as you come in, and it sets a mood that this is a temple of culture. This is not just any place. So then how, how do you integrate these ideas of what we could call, in quotation marks, traditional uh, mythologies with your own uh, with your own observations of nature and your own for example we were talking earlier about your observing this past winter uh, the decay of trees that have fallen or uh, lichen that has sprouted on uh, on branches on your uh, near your house and that does that create your own sort of mythology about nature life and death and continu continuity as the ideas about um, the, the, the legends that we've been hearing about all our lives do? I think living up here has helped me to understand nature in a way I could not have done in Manhattan. And so the first time I saw a tree fall, I actually had to do a painting about it because it was so final. It was so, you know, this tree is never going to come back after, you know, 50 years of living in the ground. And what that was about became part of like accepting that the past is past and the present is the most important thing. And so this tree actually fell during a snowstorm where we lost electricity for three days. And I brought the branches in and I started drawing them immediately. And so I started taking pictures. The, the photographs in the hallway are my phone photographs of the lichen and then started studying how to draw and paint lichen. This is something I've never done. And it turns out that there's, you know, eight feet vertically twice, so it's 16 feet of lichen that I wanted to paint. <laughs> it's like, how do you do that? Well, you start small. You start little, you look at it and you try a littler brush, and then a littler brush, and then you mix the color, and then you finally have it so that you can do this Baroque painting. I don't think of them as Japanese or Chinese, which is comments I've gotten. To me, it's very Baroque. It's more like Fregonard or something you would see in a Baroque palace. And again, the idea of this place being very, very special. So also, the, the I'm very interested to ask you too about the paintings that you do in series, because um, I referenced the exhibition that you did at the Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield some years ago, and that was a series uh, for a particular place, for a jurisprudence um, site. Right. Uh, this is a series done very specifically for a cultural site. Uh, do you often work in, in series? And um, how would you, con how did you conceive of this show? I mean, you could, I could look at one work and think, think it's totally different from another, but they all cohere. They all have a, uh, they all have, uh, they're speaking to one another, let's say. That's, that's good. I think part of preparation for the show was that Frank, who had the show previous to mine, had created a model of the space and gave it to Linda to share <coughs> with the next artist, which was me. And I had a model to work with, which is what I do when I have a public project. When I did Grand Central Station, we created a model of the waiting room. And then I spent months with that model and play with the idea of what could be where. And, um, but actually, when you bring the pieces here, it didn't work out as well as I thought it was going to work out. It was something different. Like those two paintings were created for that wall because you come in and I wanted it to be like a passageway, you know, like this tumbling flowers being like where the goddess comes into the room. So uh, it, it sets a mood that takes you away from every day. I also wanted to ask you about, um, and you can all think of your own questions because that's very important uh, in a dialogue. It's not just me and, and Roberto. So we'll, um, we'll get to your questions in a little while. But uh, one of the things that I am so interested in your work about is the play of space. Uh, I've seen you working, I've seen you working on you know, tiny, almost fragmentary drawings, collages, uh, slightly larger paintings, all in preparation for a, a monumental picture. And I think some of these could be defined as, uh, as monumental. So um, I guess what I'm asking you is, how do you uh, conceive of the elements, disparate elements, for example, in the painting at the very end. If you could turn around and look at that, 
picture, you might think, oh, that there are many different uh, things going on here. There is a reference to a bird. There's a reference to a what appears to be a sculpture and a, uh, an abstract form in the upper right and another in the upper left. So um, a casual viewer would say this is like a collage, a putting together of disparate elements. But then when you speak about it, you uh, bring out the coherence of all of these uh, varying, uh, uh, varying um, port portions of your picture. And so tell us a bit about your, create, your creative process, about putting things together. Because it is like a collage. It's like putting, you know, putting um, a, a scrapbook together of your ideas or references to people and uh, creating spaces that are sometimes hard to penetrate. Because I think one of the things that intrigues me about your work too is how you have these references to near space, to middle space, to far space, and then they keep, they keep uh, um, I don't know, fighting with one another to create a highly personal space that is yours alone. So maybe you could talk to us about this type of collage element in your work and maybe even talk about this painting because it's so filled with references to yourself, to uh, a recently deceased friend, etc. That was the first painting I did for the show and it was kind of difficult. I mean, once you get going, it's not so hard, but to get started on that scale was difficult. So I started with a small collage, and it's a tribute or a remembrance of Donald Batchelor, who passed away. And we weren't that close at the end of his life, but knew him early in the 80s and the 90s in New York. We were friendly. We were at all these exhibits at the Times in New York, Lower Manhattan's Village. But um, when he moved up here, I always imagined that we would get old and we would go visit each other's studios. And I thought, this would be so great. We're going to get together again after all these years because we're up here. And so that's part of being up here. There's a different kind of relationship to artists. I mean, it's closer in a way. People invite you over. It's not, in New York, it's kind of, everybody's too busy. But here, you take the time. And so I didn't get to say goodbye to them. So this is my goodbye. Good night. And so the Bluebird is actually a sculpture that he did that was uh, at an art forum. The, the little figure on the right is representing me saying goodbye, and it's me in kind of ritualistic robes of some kind. And it's a sketch of that. Uh, the, the jigsaw puzzle and all, everything else, is bits of abstract paintings that I pulled out of art forum for their uh, texture and for kind of I want it to be almost like um, balloons, uh, like in a comic book. These are the thoughts that these two figures are talking to each other and saying goodbye or good night. So that's the first painting. And I'm, I'm very moved by this story because I didn't know the story until you told me recently. Um, and I think another thing that strikes anyone who walks into this room is your extraordinary use of color. Now, you referenced your uh, project for Grand Central Station, and perhaps many people in this room don't know that you did a major m uh, mural for Grand Central Station, which is actually a very hard thing to find. It is in a waiting room, and you have to know where it is, and then you find it, and it is a spectacular, you're surrounded by works of art that have references to nature. And I am thinking about that by looking at these two uh, paintings right here. And there in Grand Central, and uh, actually in any of these works behind us or in front of us, color plays such an uh, a, a indelible role. That, that's not a pun, but it is definitely a, part of, a major part of your visual vocabulary. And I wondered if you could discuss it a little bit more. How I use color? Yeah. I think it's emotional. There's a lot of emotion in colors I select and the relationship of the colors together to speak to certain kinds of emotion that are revived in the viewer when they're looking at them. So I just saw Grand Central again for the first time in years. It's been closed because of the train station they were making below. And they relit it. And I was really impressed with my own work. I was like, wow, those are really good colors. <laughs> and, you know, 
after all these years, I mean, it's, oh, how, I mean, it was 1997 when it was made and put up. So, you know, over 20 years, I, it's been up. And the colors are as brilliant and talking to each other and moving. I mean, that's the other thing. I don't think color is just color. Color is shape and shape moves. And so there's movement. That's one of the most important things to me in a painting is how it moves. Mm -hmm. And my old dealer, Bob Miller, said, your paintings have wind. And I love that idea. Wind. Wind. That there's and a wind blowing through them and things are moving. And, uh -huh. and I love that idea. That they have color, but the color is in motion. It's, it's doing something with everything around it. So it's not separate. So I'm looking just to my right. And um, I also had a very interesting experience with Roberto about a year or so ago. Uh, the students in the Graduate School of Art History at NYU, called the Institute of Fine Arts, uh, a group of them came to the studio, uh, and I went with them. And they were specifically interested in looking at uh, Roberto's work of the 1980s, in which there is a lot of color, a lot of movement, a lot of expressive form. And these were, and, and I see still a lot of that in these paintings, and you mentioned downtown New York in the 80s, where you were, where you met all of these artists, and I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about that part of your formation and what of that uh, still lingers in your work today. I think having these works, I have 65 large works on paper that I discovered in a crate, and I pulled them out and I started looking at them and showing them to colleagues and, and people in New York City. And I think just revisiting that work has kind of brought back that interest that I had in that kind of life. And they're really lively and they're very explicit, they're very sexual, they're very uh, of the moment. There's a lot of expression of how the paint is put down. And like the, the, the thing at the Grand Central, the colors are all there. It looks like, you know, it was painted yesterday. And so, you know, tribute to acrylic paint, which everybody made fun of at first, that it was like so plasticky. It's beautiful if you know how to handle it. You know? <laughs> and so that, revisiting those works, I think did inform how I could deal with a figure in two different ways in one panel. You know, there's things that happen, and it's kind of a drama. And again, TSL having a stage in the room, I thought, well, drama is part of it. So these two paintings were painted for the stage. So could you, since they're the paintings that are most accessible visually to our audience, could you talk to us a little bit about the interaction between these two complex images and how they resonate on a stage, how they, how they work in tandem one with the other? Well, they're looking at each other. I mean, there's these kind of scruffy brown figures. This is Ka which is an Egyptian god of life. He's the person that, that gives life to humans and can take it away. So everything in life depends on Ka. And so this is Ka's apartment in New York. <laughs> and he likes modern things. And he's, uh, he's on top of a grid, which is from a chicken basket, a fried chicken basket that I've kept for you know, a long, long time because I just love the pattern. And so I recreated that as part of his apartment. It's called Idle Apartment is the title. So there's fun. I mean, part of what I feel so privileged to have is I can have fun and enjoy making things. That's part of it. And so this does refer to the 80s work. I did figures very much like this in the 80s. And um, it was fun to think of that as a, a god who could bring the life to this room. Again, this one, there's a uh, when I was painting this, I got a phone call from Mexico. My niece called, and I showed it to her. She said, well, who is that? And I said, I made him up. She goes, That's where I got the title, Made Up Mythologies. I said, it's nobody. He's made up. kind of looks like me, but it's not me. You know? He's some royalty that is in the room. Pardon? Oh. And so those are two sons of Horus. And those two figures come from Chinese wall painting in China. I've been going to China for four summers in a row. I was on tour of Chinese uh, sites with other Chinese artists. Okay, louder. So mixing up cultures, I think, is part of the play that I do. And part of the drama that I do is for the stage. Mixing those things up. And a lot of those things come from the 80s sensibility. And if 
sometime there were to be some mega exhibition of 80s New York downtown art. Right. This work would fit in, even though it was done in 2022-23. You can take the boy out of East Village, but you can't take East Village out of the boy. <laughs> do, do you want to comment a little bit about that um, time period and how you, uh, how you sort of manipulated your life with other artists and where you were showing? And just talk to us a bit about that moment, which was so uh, incredibly rich in, um, in creativity. Well, it was, it was all there. Basically, I was on Houston and 2nd Avenue over Yona Schimmel. The Knishery. That was my first studio, my first home in New York City. And, you know, Basquiat was right down the street. He invited me over to his studio and gave me a painting that helped change my real estate in New York for a long time. And, you know, Keith Haring was a buddy, and I remember when he painted the wall. But when they talk about these villages, I'm not included because I was showing uptown. And so I was considered an uptown artist, but I wasn't. I was a downtown artist showing uptown. But then I had a show downtown at La Mama Galleria, which was my studio, and I, I showed early works. And I remember somebody at the exhibition going, this is an uptown artist's downtown show. <laughs> I was like, no, it isn't. But anyway, people were trying to figure out how I fit in, and I never quite fit into any of the schools. I just painted what I wanted to paint. And luckily, I had a, a great place to show them. I mean, Robert Miller had an incredible stable of great artists that I got to meet and hang out with. And that became what was feeding me as much as downtown culture, which I never left. I mean, I'm still in the East Village. I'm on 8th Street and Avenue East. As well as Canaan. Yes. So, but you were also in, at, um, in the late 80s, early 90s, in exhibitions of what was sometimes called Hispanic artists. And that put you into a different category. Right. I think artists, particularly at that point, were very um, like sort of schizophrenic. In a way, they belonged downtown, or they belonged uptown, or they were Hispanic artists, or they were German expressionists, or they were the young Brits, or something like that. And you seem to have fit well into a variety of those categories. Right. Well, PS1, downtown New York, which is called New Wave New York, was the first big show I was included in. And it was 100 artists from all over that you know, were from downtown New York. And the great art dealer, Nina Nose, saw my work there and offered me to be included in one of her shows. And that was the beginning of you know, downtown, downtown, and uptown <laughs> mixing up. Yeah, and so the rest is history. Weber. And John Weber. John Weber said that if he, was, if he weren't in the other galleries, he would have taken his guy. Wow. So I am sure that, uh, that Roberto's um, perceptions about his work and the 80s and later has provoked uh, some ideas or questions in your mind. So why don't we have some of uh, the audience's comments or, uh, or questions? And we have a bit of time for that. So, and if not, I'll, we can keep talking. <laughs> but, I don't um, know what time it is. Yeah. And last question. Please. So, Roberta, you know, you, you were impacted by Cleopatra. Did, <laughs> the, did, did the Egyptian theme continue to throw, flow through your work, or did it just vanish from the 60s until today? How did, where was Egypt in that whole time? Well, at that time, there were drawings, kids' drawings. And I think this place spurred it on, because I was trying to imagine what was time, space limited. It was. I thought a, a regal, a temple, uh, uh, you know, a refuge, and so that's what brought it on. And didn't weren't you uh, impacted also by the King Tut exhibition that traveled around the United States? I haven't. I mean, I read the catalog. It's an amazing story, but I never saw that exhibit. Mm -hmm. It was what seventy eight, right? Yeah, it was in the late seventies. Yes, there, please. Another aspect of Egypt in your life, though. Because uh, you and I both went to school oh. at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale in Little Egypt, just north of Cairo, <laughs> Illinois. It's true. And we shared a teacher that actually has motivated me and helped me a lot and develop as an artist, which is Jimmy Wright. Jimmy Wright. Yeah. And we were just at his uh, reception in New York and found out that we were both in the same area. But uh, didn't know, did not know that. Yeah. 
it changed my life, meeting him in debt school and that place, and the freedom. It was a really beautiful place. Yes, it was an extraordinary moment. And here we are. In, in terms of Chicago, and now recognize you in just a second, I don't want to forget something that Roberto told me a long time ago, that one of the aspects or one of the influences that just popped into his mind was when you were 12 or 13 and your class made a trip to the Art Institute of Chicago. Right. And right. there was in the bookshop a book about uh, Van Gogh and it had a sunflower on the cover. Uh, you bought the book, you still have it, and that was another fountain of inspiration. Yeah, but the fact that we didn't have art books in the house that I could buy, it was on sale, it was a dollar. And I just remember taking it home and thinking, wow, you can actually do this. And you can remember the painting that you saw, you know, and connect to that painting in a deep way that I didn't know what that was, but I felt it. I mean, there was a deep understanding that painting was really important. And no one had told me that before. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I'm curious, what came first, this large one or this one that it talks to in the home? The little one first. That's the study, and it's actually from a photograph that's out there that I took of some um, crabapple tree blossoms in my yard. So a lot of this show is what's happening in this place in this time to me as an artist. The way it was hung, I mean, you just you see them, and it's like, whoa! I just noticed that it's wonderful. That that was the plan that you would see the preparation first, and then you would come in and see what came from that preparation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of all of the artists I know, Roberto's um, repertory of preparatory drawings and collages and all other forms is so beautifully thought out and so carefully done uh, when you are thinking about a new series. And, uh, you know, I have many times the pleasure of seeing it, but uh, the fact that in the show you dedicated a specific space to preparatory images and then the viewer, the visitor comes in here and sees the end product. I think it, it's, it's quite spectacular. Yeah. Well, I have two questions, actually. Um, I see that in that, in that painting and in the one directly behind you, there are dog-like figures. So I thought, well, could, it didn't seem likely they could be illusions to Cerberus, because Cerberus wouldn't have had anything to do with Egyptian Egyptian mythology, so maybe you just like dogs. Or, I don't. Or, or maybe you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I'm just kidding. The other thing that I wanted to ask you is this, is it. this painting over here. Yeah, let's see where it's from. Uh, this yeah. painting over here. Yeah. Um, did you say that it doesn't have any, there's no, did you say that there's no influence of Japanese or Chinese scroll uh, art? No, I didn't say that. I just oh. said that. What I was thinking about when I was working and making it was French Baroque art. Even though I think, yeah, the, the use of nature, the paper, the materials are Japanese. It's mulberry. And it's painting uh, mulberry. Everything in this room has mulberry on it. So there is the surface that is very Japanese. That's created by you know, a history of working with paper. And um, I use it for transparency and for layering. Although one of the sources that you mentioned is this figure here, which comes from a postcard from the Louvre, uh, which is of an, an Egyptian dog. So do dogs, even though dogs don't play a large role, in my life. they're running around somewhere. Um, Roberto and David have beautiful cats, and the cats don't make, the, make it into your work as animals, but as symbols. The, 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 vi the visitor comes in the main door of Time Space Limited, and there is Bastet, who is the Egyptian, one of the Egyptian members of the huge uh, pantheon of gods and goddesses, and she is a cat. And um, so, and protector of women and children. Yes, in the home. And Here. so, we're protecting all the women and all the children. <laughs> So was there another, another hand raised? Oh, there. I really, really always respect so much in your work, you know, the, someone used the word freedom, but for me it's license. You know, you give yourself license. You, don't, you have a certain kind of confidence, 
about roaming through culture and making anything you see fit to use in a way that, you know, in the PC era of teaching that has come upon us, you know, you really, not only do you find your own way to connect to the images and feel completely okay about using them, you express, you know, you don't get cornered by those isms or groups or labels or, you know, you see it as somewhere you can float very lightly and freely through it and use anything. And I really admire that in your work. Thank you. So, are there uh, any other questions or comments before we let Roberto have a drink? Go and have a drink? No? Well, I, I hope that you look carefully. One thing that you cannot do. Oh, wait, there is another question in the back. Sorry. Uh, Roberto, earlier we were talking about um, your, your past with uh, filmmaking. Right. And then some of these paintings are rather cinematic. I think that's good. I mean, that you bring that up. I, my graduate studies was not in art or painting; it was in filmmaking, and I was very drawn to optical printing, which is where a camera faces a projector, and you can rephotograph every frame. So the idea that you could hold a, a bit of time in your hand and how you could change time by how you photograph it, I think plays into all of this. I mean, this is all about you know moving in and moving out, which is what you would do with an optical printer. And the edges of the paper often don't match, so you can see what's behind it. So this is like cells. The, like composing visually is what I learned from filmmaking. And using time as a subject, I think, is something we learn in filmmaking. Which brings us back to time and space. <laughs> That's what you need. And so I think we might uh, conclude by just um, my hoping that you look at this work with care. And uh, actually, I remember when I was a very young student, there was a book about um, Barbizon painting, French landscape painting of the, ninth, of the 19th century. And the end of the text said, and I've I don't know why this always sticks in my mind, if you look at this painting with love, you can feel the artist next to you moving his brush. So I think that pertains very much to Roberto Juarez's work. So I want, well, thank you for coming. I want to congratulate certainly Time and Space Limited for housing, hosting this spectacular show as part of their 50 years of spectacular cultural work. So congratulations to Claudia and to Linda. to the artist who created it. So, and, and we can have a drink, is that? Yeah, we have wine and water for everybody. So, please join us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.